Hello, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, two things, mathematical modelling and a bit later on I'll get on to optimisation. Um, well, when we think about mathematical modelling, what do, we, what do we think about? Well, modelling for a start, we probably think of some sort of dashingly good-looking person who, um, who, uh, who represents um, themselves in some certain way. But really we get hooked up on the actual person who's the model rather than what they're representing. And what does that mean about for maths? We, we think about mathematical models, we don't worry about the pen and paper, but what we're looking at is how do we represent a situation, whether that be some life-related situation or some sort of mathematical abstract situation. It doesn't matter, the syllabus tells us anyway that we need to um, model whether they be real-life situations or mathematical constructs. So how can we, uh, how can we represent something mathematically? Um, we, can, we can represent some sort of situation graphically. We could draw it as a table, maybe draw a diagram, um, create an, an equation maybe. Um, all of those are mathematical representations of some sort of situation, whether that be again life related or, or mathematically abstract. Um, the one that we hung up about the most is, uh, is, is creating mathematical equations and the way in which we develop those or derive those is uh, we can do it through our um, ability to show algebraic facility or use the graphics calculator or otherwise some sort of uh, device that's going to give us a, a, a line of best fit or some sort of regression. So what do they look like? Um, here's an example where we've got a, uh, a circle cut from a piece of paper. We've given some dimensions of that piece of paper. And it says to us, express the area as a function. So it tells us that it wants to create an algebraic model. So we do that and um, we've got to uh, construct that model somehow. Um, and as you've seen in some videos, um, we'd start with what the students already know and how they write that down will depend on uh, what they're used to, um, how the teacher shows them. In this particular example here we've got s to the power 2 written down and it's maybe a slightly different way from what we're, what we're used to. But in the end we've got an algebraic representation of a particular situation and in this case here a circle cut from a hole, sorry, a circle cut from a piece of paper the circle is the whole. Um, sometimes we're given problems um, but in, in, uh, in, in many situations it doesn't say to us um, how are we going to define what model we want. It just asks a question and this particular case here, quite a common one um, for, for many reasons. We've got a, a, an offer A and an offer B and this particular case it's, um, it's about um, some sort of uh, some media. And, but the, the, in this particular case, the problem is not defined um, according to what model that we want to do. So how do we do it? We might start with a table. It's a tabular model. We've got some, some, some numeric values. Why would we do that? First of all, though, really importantly, what we do is we define what our two variables are. That's a fairly common thing for, uh, for kiddies to miss out on these days defining what those models are and again later when we get an algebraic model we don't know what those variables represent. Well how do we go from there then to maybe another um, type of model and if we look at the CCEs we talk about translating information from one, uh, one, one um, form to another and this particular case here we're changing that, the data from a tabular model into a graphics model. The question for you all is, of course, how are we going to do this? Do we get them to do it on pen and paper in the classroom? Give them some grid paper, they might have grid paper of their own. Or do we use a graphics calculator that's going to, to um, sketch that graph for us? That's a really open-ended question. Of course, we've got to maybe develop those, both of those skills in our kiddies in our classroom. The, um, the, the syllabus uh, dictates to us that um, we need to uh, develop some st strategies and procedures um, in solving problems and some of the key things there we talk about um, clarifying and analysing problems 
some of that higher order thinking skills that we uh, we need to develop in the kiddies. One of the uh, terms that comes up from time to time when we look at syllabus documents is talking about mathematical modelling in terms of synthesising. How does, how does that happen in a classroom? What does it look like? What does it sound like? When we're talking about synthesising, we're talking about having many different models that we put together um, in conjunction to uh, solve a problem. In many cases, where you talk about um, the different concepts that we're using in maths at the same time, but the structure of them, the sequencing of them, the timing of them would, would um, be important solving the problem. For example, um, we might look at uh, the, the relationship between trigonometric and periodic functions when we might be studying something about a, uh, a roller coaster, or whatever. Um, we talked earlier about the, uh, the, the standards of the syllabus and we talked about um, in the applications um, and uh, the, the, the four criteria there. The fewer models that we would put together to solve a problem would tell us that it's a more simple problem. Um, we might have four particular concepts that we have to apply sequentially and structured in the right order and that would inherently make the problem more difficult as if we had one or two um, models to, to put together at the same time. So when we look at this in terms of assessment, we're talking about modelling, um, we see evidence of many different types of uh, ways in which we ask students to answer questions. And some of the things that we see from time to time is where questions say, part A, do this, part B, do something next. And the more scaffolding that we provide for students, we'd say that is um, creates less initiative. And so how do we then maybe think about in terms of assessment, how do we increase the initiative by not scaffolding that for the students? Another one, uh, another thing that we're asked to do from time to time is that we develop a, uh, a mathematical model, but then we apply that model to create data. And so let's go back to the old problem where a circle was cut from a piece of paper and the question might be, once we found that particular function, hence find an area for a given value of the radius. And we'd have to use that model then to, to, um, to, to derive an answer. Once again, how we do that, you might um, use pen and paper techniques, you might use a graphics calculator, um, however that might be in a table or, or, or whatever. Um, so long as we're using the, the, the model, um, again, you might ask the question a certain way so that the, the way in which we engage in that model might be predetermined. Another thing that we're uh, asked to look at is um, generating data from that model. And I've just got an example here where we've got the, uh, where we've got a, a model here of, um, say for example, a, a tide chart. And we then have to substitute the data into that, um, into that particular uh, uh, equation, algebraic model, I should say, algebraic model, to, um, in order to determine what the, uh, what the answer is. So we move on to optimization, and uh, when we think about optimization, we think optimal, what's the best? But the best might bring up some ideas of uh, might be best might be minimum, um, the best in something might be might be maximum, most or least, um, and we're we're starting to engage now in something that's a bit more useful. Um, one of the the very useful um, uh, applications of calculus. <coughs> So when we talk about uh, optimization, we're looking at the derivative and we've got to uh, ask the students to um, use some sort of model that we've done previously to, um, to work out what is our, our optimal um, answer. And so we'd find dy/dx, and we know that a stationary point's gonna give us, hopefully, unless we're looking at greatest and least values um, over a particular domain, the dy/dx equals zero gives us a stationary point. And we use our calculus um, if dy dx is uh, negative um, to the right of where our, our stationary point is, if dy dx is positive to the left, you can see there we got a nice little graphical model to say our optima, optimal answer here is going to give us a, a, a greatest value, a maximum or a most. Similarly, if we, uh, if we flip that around and say 
Um, again, we're looking where, where uh, dy dx is equal to zero, and we look at left and right values um, where that derivative is going to be negative and positive. Again, we're going to look at our, um, our graphical model, and our graphical model would tell us whether we're going to find a, a, uh, a local maximum or, or uh, sorry, minimum or a least value. Um, how might you introduce this in your classroom? Um, uh, just a nice, purely little, simple, abstract model is um, think of two numbers and uh, play that game with them, but they have to find out which the two numbers that um, produces the greatest product. And we use the word greatest there in uh, in terms of our optimal optimal answer, but keep it simple. Um, we might start with uh, going back to earlier in the video. We talked about uh, modelling the answer. I'd probably start numerically and have a look at what the what the possible answers are. Um, great discussions here would come about. Would uh, do they have to be integral values? Could they be decimals? Uh, what about if um, they were negative values, etc.? If we um, move to an abstract uh, representation of that particular same thing, um, how do we work out that um, the equation for that uh, uh, for that function is what it is? Again, would we use pencil and paper techniques? Would we use a graphics calculator to find the regression line? However, we find out that the um, the stationary points are going to uh, occur where um, the derivative is equal to zero, and we end up with a maximum product where both values are um, equal to five. What are some of the varied contexts that we would use um, in terms of teaching uh, optimization? Here's a nice little purely mathematical one, quite a common one. Given a point and a function, what's the least distance between the point and any point on that particular function? I'm not going to go into the solutions of them, but here's a nice little purely mathematical one. And first thing I would probably do would be to uh, to, to, to draw a diagram and from there we use the algebraic techniques um, in order to solve that problem. What about a real life context? Um, certainly in my, in my dealings of uh, teaching out in the country uh, many years ago, becoming engaged in uh, the local community, um, I was able to uh, spend some time with some uh, sheep farmers and I know around sheep shearing time they'd have to get as many, many sheep into a into a, a temporary pen as possible, so the shearers could come in and shear those sheep in, a, in an optimal fashion. So here's a real life situation. We've got 100 metres of fencing. Farmers are only gonna make a rectangular pen to put his uh, sheep into. What are the dimensions that's gonna give us the greatest area? I'd be looking at starting a problem like this way back in, uh, in uh, middle school, um, but I wouldn't be looking at the, uh, the, the algebraic concepts of um, dy dx. Um, and so when we get to, when we get to uh, creating a, a mathematical model that would enable us to solve that equation, again, the first thing I'd go back to, as we said earlier, um, drawing diagrams, creating algebraic equations from maybe tables, and then from that point, then we can solve the equation. Well, thanks for watching the video today, guys.